Hey. Hey. Uh, I'm Brett, uh, and you have found it and me in this session. So thanks for being here. Um, we're talking about H2O, blah, blah, blah. We see what that says. Um, so let's talk about it. How many here have like poked around or used? I know a couple of people have used it, know about it. Some new people, some new folks. Okay, cool. So uh, what I think we'll do for this is we're going to uh, – I'll introduce myself a little more. I'll talk about what it is and why it is, uh, how it works. Then we will go into kind of its governing principles. We'll talk about we have a new redesign that's launching this summer. Uh, so we're going to kind of be pushing it out as well uh, beyond current use. Um, I just hope maybe where you guys come in. Um, some of the challenges we have with this, which I'm sure some of you have encountered as far as either faculty who want to use different case books or different unconventional, you know, teaching methods or, you know, how they use the materials, uh, all of that. And then also what's coming down the line. So, uh, cool. Hi. I'm Brett. Uh, I work at the Library Innovation Lab at Harvard Law School Library. In there, uh, my background is I started more in customer support on the support side tech, and then I uh, directed academic technology at a small arts college north of Boston in Beverly, Massachusetts. Um, and from that, I moved into the law school. So I'm not a librarian, I'm not a lawyer, but I work at a law library. Uh, but on the, the tech, academic tech, uh, support and outreach side. Uh, my training, my background is actually more in, uh, I was a theater major, <laughs> so I also, I'm a performer, an actor, a comedian, I produce workshops and I produce shows. And so if you have any like juicy gossip on Dane Cook, just you know, let me know. Uh, cool. Uh, it's weird working at Harvard. It's like, okay, Harvard, well, okay. And uh, so that's a thing. But I also feel lucky to work with this team. I think we are working, there's some cool stuff we're working on, and I genuinely do like think the projects can make a difference. So, um, yeah, that's me. This is probably familiar. We got a Torts casebook here. About 150 bucks, uh, 800 something pages. It's got cases, it's got head notes, summaries. We've got students who only use half of it for their course. They still pay out the full price. But here's an example of a casebook on the new H2O, the redesign. This one's called Dinkins Up to Client. So it's not quite a case book, but it's a book of cases. So uh, this is how a student will look at it on, on the web. This one is free because the platform is free. The instructor created this themselves. So all the content is specific to his course, his or her course. And here's an example of a case in there. So the student begins reading it. There's the heading. And I've thrown this little arrow right there because you can see uh, a little ellip ellipsis there, ellipses. And that is showing where uh, there is case content, just like a real real case book. There's case content that's hidden because it's not relevant to the course. Hey, go ahead. Hey. Um, um, very important question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah, let me, let me just go quick through why having an open case book platform makes sense like the H2O. Um, but first of all, all content in H2O is the ellipsis. Can you expand that? Yes, you can. It's not there. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so that also. Um, all content on H2O is under Creative Commons, through no license, attributable, non-commercial, share-alike. So uh, anything that a teacher instructor puts on, uh, it's under that license. Also, what H2O does is, I'll talk about this more, but it has a remix, a clone and remix function. So if I build out a criminal law casebook and you're teaching at Villanova, uh, you can just hit clone, you get your own copy of all my content, you can edit it and use it for your own course. Uh, again, it's personal, so specific to the instructor. They craft it themselves. Uh, yeah, this is an example. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, for some reason, it's my go-to. I'm like, well, no, I just I guess I like saying it. Um, uh, it's practical, again, it's specific to the course, uh, and they're not lugging around a casebook that they're only going to use half of. It's collaborative with that remix thing I mentioned, um, and of course it's flexible as a digital platform as opposed to a casebook. Things can be added, say, day of or day before, 
they start to let you know. If you need to pull one point, you prefer, and uh, surprise, uh, a text that is specific to their course instead of a traditional one, uh, naturally. We'll get into a little bit if they prefer it, if they prefer a, a physical copy or a digital copy, because that's, that's definitely relevant. Some of the precepts, access and simplicity. So when a student goes in, they don't need to create an account. They just need to link to the link to the casebook. They click it, nice and readable, scroll. That's important to us. We're also doing a big push on accessibility now in the new redesign. Uh, we have an awesome, awesome developer in the lab in Becky Cromana, who is sort of an accessibility, passionate about it, expert at it. She's really been given H2O oh, once over for that. Construction is a big thing with H2O as well. So it's a platform where casebooks can live. Um, and you know, there's different ways, like there's eLangell, for example, as a way to uh, for interpreters to use like open materials and they can customize them themselves. Um, H2O has that uh, in that there's content on there, but it, it it's important to us to be able to give instructors the tools to build their own casebook as well. Uh, how that works, for example, on the H2O redesign. Here's an example of a casebook. So we have, we have the sections, you have the cases, and in this case, uh, like right in this screenshot, my mouse was hovering over, we're in draft mode, my mouse is hovering over US versus EC net company. And how that operates is just a click and drag. I want to bring up the translation, I click and drag it, I let go, and it plops it in there. So that's how sort of the sequencing works. You add an item, a resource, a case, a link up to the web, uh, a, PDF, you know, a link to a PDF, whatever it is, put it in order, and then you can drag and drop through your range. It's pretty simple. Uh, in the case itself, we have a annotation sidebar pop up here for actually making the case edits, uh, which obviously is in the cases are so long, but only a piece of it's relevant to the students. In this case, uh, you can see paragraph 48, drag and selected. You get this bar that pops up on the right side here automatically. If they want to hide it, they want to elide it, they click elide, and it snaps down to the ellipses. And then a student reading on the web can just click that ellipses, snaps open to see what was hidden by the instructor. If they want to do that, if that's their, if that's their thing. That's also used actually by instructors in, uh, like during a course, if they want to, for some, sometimes a student will ask a question, they'll want to scroll that section and be like, oh, actually, here's the detail that I did. So sometimes it's used, it's used in class as well. Hmm. I'll harp on this a bit throughout, but really have an eye towards self-sufficiency for these, instru these instructors. We can't support everyone doing it. So it's got to be local to the instructor and their assistant. Um, you know, if there's, ideally, there's someone at the institution, maybe the library who uh, knows something or two about the platform, it can kind of be a liaison as well. We're trying to map it similar to our Perma CC product, which is the link that citation preservation product, where uh, there's sort of a local rep at the place that can field questions and give a hand, and then for tech issues that come up or you know larger scale things, those can bubble up to us. But um, that's what we're really, really developing with an eye towards. Uh, we don't have to play the middleman. Uh, and of course, the remixing under Creative Commons and export. Export. Why do we want to export digital? Because people like a book. <laughs> people like all something in their hands. Uh, and yeah, we found it through. You, you'd think, but they want it. And they want, of course, they want something to make, take notes on, to highlight for themselves. Um, and so that's that's another big big part of H2O. So uh, let's see. Um, let's do this right now. So we actually recently, we've been helping a couple of instructors export their content out of H2O and put it into uh, InDesign <coughs> and turn it into a book. So these are two, these are print-on-demand books through CreateSpace, Amazon CreateSpace. And so for these courses, for torts and corporations, All the content in these books was built, constructed, and edited in H2O, exported to a Word doc. And for these specific ones, because that's sort of our guinea pig round, uh, we put them into InDesign and we had a library person or you know, 
an existing, a new design, give it some, some real TLC. Once we did that, turned it into a PDF, sent it to Amazon CreateSpace, and the students got a link to the casebook online, but also a link to the Amazon purchase location. And that's, and so, they, so the Torts book is on sale on Amazon now, pretty much at cost. It's like 25 bucks. Um, and obviously it's like page one three hundred. It's specific to, you know, the trans course, which is a big change then. You have your Torts book and a supplemental and this thing and this thing. Um, could keep going into that as we yeah, go. And I'm printing out what formats are available in other ones. You mentioned Word for printing, but otherwise, I guess they're. So, yes, yeah, so you. Yes, yeah, so you. So direct export from HO right now is closed. It's just set to Word. Word export. Um, the PDF is a PDF option that we kind of switched off because it's just a little buggy. And Word is kind of just you can just make it a PDF for Word anyway. Yeah. Yeah. For an e so there's no there's no automatic ebook through okay. HO. But when you put it up on GreenSpace. <laughs> They give you a, do you also want to put this on Kindle? And then you do a couple tweaks for formatting size, and they offer it on Kindle as well. Um, and we did look at, we looked at, we looked at Lulu, we looked at CreateSpace, so this, so it's not limited to, the structures aren't limited to, you know, the fact that we use CreateSpace for the HLS instructors, our HLS instructors. Um, so, let's touch on a couple of things about this redesign. One big thing, <laughs> It's sort of invisible, but it means it was super helpful for us. Old H2O, original H2O, was developed at the Berkman Center at Harvard, at Harvard Law, um, supported there, and there was a group of outside, we had like outside developers working on it. So they were kind of our team. But the redesign, we were able to bring both those things in-house. So the Library Innovation Lab and the Law School Library is now where, uh, that's where H2O lives, and the developers are in-house. So that, that just saves time, it saves us, uh, Hassle trying to reach out to people in different time zones, and so, so, so that's been nice. Uh, another big change in how it works is now the casebook is where you do all your work from. That casebook view I'll show you, I'll show you in a sec again. As opposed to in older H2O, you just had a kind of like you had a bunch of components. You you make a resource, you make what we call a playlist, just like a bucket to put things in. Uh, you make a link, and then you would you know drag all those things in. Um, so, like, this is the old, this is old H2O. So, in this case, you know, we have Hal Jackson, and he's got playlists, he's got annotated items, he's got text cases, all sort of jumbled up in this dashboard here. Um, this is the dashboard in the new H2O. Cleaner, simpler, and the casebook is where you do, you're doing your work from. So, I would click into one of these casebooks, and that's where I would add resources, I would move things around, but sort of the casebook is now the uh, the, the, the location that we're working from. The other reason we did that change is, I mean, old H2O was, was built with this idea that you can use it for any concentration, um, which you can. Why it works great for law is because, you know, 90% of a case book is public domain. We own, the, we own the content. So we can upload the stuff right onto H2O. Could create a Commons, or good to go. All that. If it was, you know, a history textbook, we couldn't just upload it because a lot of the content will be, you know, custom, copyrighted. Um, so for the newest tool and the redesign, let's 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 focus on the casebook. Let's focus on this arena that seems like it needs rectification. As we all know, with the cost of textbooks, with publishers who are breaking in this money on um, Content that's only five percent theirs, etc. Um, <coughs> draft moment is another big change. Old H2O, you make a change. It's 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 happening right. It's happening at the same time. And the new one, uh, this is actually really like this feature. So right here we have actually two concurrent textbooks. We've got this one that students can view, no problem, access. And we have the one that you access if you click here. So that's the draft version of this casebook. I could be making changes to that. I'm not closing off access to the casebook to the students. And then when I'm ready, I hit publish, and it pushes the changes, and it deletes the draft. Make sense? That's a cool, that's a, that's a change, and I'm, I'm, I dig that because it's neat. Accessibility I mentioned, and also a more responsive site. Um, okay. Cool.
seems like faculty talk, talk a lot about wanting to do new stuff, but making the jump is a different story. Yeah, same. <laughs> We've had the same. Adoption and buy-in. What, what, what do people do? Some of them, we have some people on each show that do, that do do remix. Uh, Jeannie Sook at Harvard Law is a criminal law instructor. And Tim Wu at Columbia also teaches criminal law. And he's remixed her content, uh, which is cool, because they're both, they're both names. And they're using H2O. That's exciting. Um, so we've got, we've got some remix happening. Um, I, think the, I think the coolest example is Terry Fisher at Harvard Law teaches uh, copyright. And he teaches a course called Copyright X. And in that course, he's got about 15 satellite courses around the world that teach that teach are teaching at the same time as him. So what they can do is they just cloned his Facebook and they have their own version of copyright, all these copyright cases, all this copyright content, and they've just added some of their own country's copyright uh, materials as well. That's a cool example of remix. Um, the biggest jump I think for people using H2O is if it's a new instructor who wants to use it to make something brand new, they gotta do some work. Who likes to do that? Uh, so that means speaking, deciding <coughs> releases, and that means making edits to those cases as well, like doing that direct drop. The most straightforward way I feel like I've seen instructors go about that is they print out all the cases they want, they use pen and paper, they X the sections they don't want, and they give it to their assistant, say, or their research assistant, say, you know, make these make these changes in H2O. Um, as far as a practical way to get a faculty member to move on this kind of thing, that seems like a way for that to happen. Because then they still get to make those edits, but it's, it's less than having to figure out how to use the platform. Let me go through this list. Here's some things on H2O. Here's some uh, case books we have. Uh, intellectual property. Admin law, con law, First Amendment, food law, legislation, regulation, corporation, international human rights law, criminal law, contracts, conflict of laws, CIPRO, copyright, digital media, media, cyber law, torts, federal budget policy, security, regulation. Thank you for listening. Uh, paper books. Like I said, people want the books. But what's not easy is turning, even if you have the content, turning into a nice looking thing like that. How do we make the export feature, how do we make that as seamless as possible? Because we don't want to have to take, take that workload on. We'd like to not have an assistant have to do, you know, have to learn in design just so their instructor could make a book. So what we're, think, we're thinking a lot about is, yeah, how do, we, how do you make that seamless? How do you go from click export Click upload to create space or Lulu as few steps as possible. What we're doing this summer, we actually have it's um, Larry Lessig's assistant is working on a con law text, and what she's doing is we're trying to not get InDesign involved at all. We're just going to see how it goes from export to Word, and then uh, maybe we give it a, a once over for chapter breaks, that kind of thing and then up to create space. So we're going to see how that goes, but that's ideal. Again, so an instructor anywhere doesn't have to maybe even have Creative Cloud. They can go from Word to Print on Demand. That's, that's the dream. Uh, and I think that's the quickest way, you know, we get this content out there. It's the quickest way to usurp, hopefully, some of this, this you know, this publisher domination of the casebook field, which is Again, silly. <laughs> Appeal. These books, I tell you, you tell an instructor about, about a show, oh, cool, okay, interesting, okay. You show them a book with a colleague's name on it, <laughs> they, I don't know if it's just jealousy or it's excitement or what it is, but the physical book gets a crazy response. You get, you get, this, you get this immediate reaction, and, oh, wow, you know, isn't the system interesting? Uh, and that's, I mean, that's, that's been A, instructive, uh, informative, but it's also encouraging. Like, okay, so there, there's, you know, 
you got to get the hook. You know what I mean? You got you to get something to, to hook them in and, and commit to the, you know, commit to the choice. You get to talk, of, I want to do this for my students, but, you know, they get used to using the same piece book or just kind of rolling on. Um, so that's, I don't know, that, that's exciting. Self efficiency. And also, of course, we have, we have, we want to be able to support people who are teaching without, um, like, we can make these case books because these are, it's mostly cases. Uh, copyright isn't an issue. We have um, the Charles Free Contracts book. He had two items that were, that did have copyright, but he was able to acquire the licenses. One of them was for academic use, we were able to use it free. And the other one, uh, the author held the rights, and he just emailed the author, and the guy's like, go for it. So that worked out, but you know that's not everybody. So we sold we, we, Chris Babbitt at the you know uh, Berkman Klein Center. He's got a music and digital media course. It's all links to the web. It's all um, PDFs that are you know he's been given approval to show his class privately because his friends and the you know his brothers in the music industry. So he's able to like, kind of get this, get the sort of content. That's not going to go. He's not going to make a book anytime soon. But we still want to have a platform so he can use it and support. We can support him on that. Um, yeah. Um, more text. Great. Uh, what's common? CAP integration. CAP is our case law access project at the library lab. CAP just finished scanning just five months ago. Um, 40 million pages out of 42,000 volumes of US case law. The UK case that was at, the law school, uh, they started this project, they collaborated with a startup, uh, a legal information startup, and uh, collected all the volumes, uh, purchased the high-speed digital scanner, purchased a guillotine, and got a team together, a digitization team. So they took them a year and a half plus to do the scanning, but it was 14-hour shifts in the... Uh, in, in a room in the law school, so you could just look into the window and see this going. Let me see. Do these oh, request access? All right. Well, I had a couple of gifts. I had a couple of videos of paper. Maybe I'll pull it up. In uh, uh, all right. Uh, maybe at the end I'll, I'll show videos. Uh, but it's that was just a scan. It was a pretty big scan. Forty about forty two thousand volumes, forty million pages of scanning U.S. case law because the case law is ours but we cannot have access to it, essentially, unless we, to us law. That's goofy. <clears throat> it's been digitized. It's in the process now of final stages of getting the metadata schema applied to it to actually make it useful for researchers to access to the API and <coughs> anyone else. Um, but what's coming next is plugging that, all those cases, into H2O. So whatever instructor is coming along to teach, they can search in H2O, go through the CAP, CAP API, the CAP API, and uh, pull it into H2O. Right now, for cases in H2O, uh, like we've manually added several thousand, a whole bunch. But when there are new ones that have to come along, they have to be ingested manually. So we, um, we have sort of an agreement with FastCase where they say, you know, go ahead and what we have going to get access to, or we'll I will scrape a Google Scholar page, something like that, uh, that they've already uploaded on the web. Um, you know, have it just be the content that it's not copyright, <coughs> of course, um, but it's a manual ingest. So that sort of, that comes through us. We have to do that ourselves. Um, within the next 12 months, 10, 12 months, or if we have this cap plugged in, and that means all of US case law will be accessible for each show as well. Uh, Federal land states? Yes. Yeah. Go back how far? Oh, as far back as it goes. So 16. Four, fifth, or fifth, or fifth, or fifth, or fifth. Yeah. In the 1600s. <laughs> and will that be accessible outside of H2O as well? Yes. Yeah, so, so the um, yeah, the CAP API is uh, that's also in the final stages. Um, through the through the agreement with Ravel, it's sort of they have they have. For people who sign on with Ravel, they get a, a capless uh, access for anyone for researchers and academics. There's also a basically you, you sign an agreement, and they also get no cap to access. And then I believe it's like the general public when it's fully operational. I think it's up to 500 cases a day. The average person can 
can do up until the contract runs out in seven years, or you know, there's a little, all these clauses and stuff. Like for example, if a state, um, if if a state changes the way it uploads cases to fully to fully digital, I'm not in the cap projects, so I don't know the exact wording, but essentially, if a state changes how it uh, distributes its its uh, court opinions to a certain digital format that we're, you know, we're trying to, trying to get more people on board with. Um, when that happens, all that, case, all that state's cases are fully unlocked within CAP. And they're access to, you know, there's no CAP to access that state's cases. Um, uh, export, like I said, we're trying to make it so that seamless click and upload and are off to the races. Um, as we know, because this the physical book that option is important. Digital is great, and the digital is—I mean, like it's, it should be a digital platform for being able to for creating, for constructing it. <laughs> so obviously, I can collage uh, by hand. But the export, we gotta we gotta have an option. Um, and then just various enhancements to the system. We wanna use just a, a, a smattering collaborators. So um, I can give you access to edit my casebook. Um, improving the UI to make it easier to use. Uh, I'm, I'm I have this idea of like an advanced edit mode, so almost like a thumbnail view where you can do things or, or select multiple items and move them at once. Uh, an easy casebook build mode where you can build up the sections quickly all together. Um, notifications, so if you clone my casebook and I make a change, you can set it so you can get notified, oh, he deleted this case. I want to, you know, do you want to reflect this change? That kind of thing would, I think would be a cool feature. Um, but that's the direction I'm thinking of that too. Uh, so that's the question. I mean, like, do you have faculty? Do you teach, and would your faculty be into this? Uh, and if not, why not? Uh, what What would be the block? Again, there's 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 the challenges. There's these challenges to adoption of, you know, it's appealing, but getting on board is the workload. Some of them, um, you know, some of them teach out their own books. So there may be afraid of that that loss. But from what I understand, uh, they don't make a lot off of that. Yeah. It's almost more like a, it's almost more like to have your name on a book is a bigger part of the thing. Sometimes I don't even think that it counts for it depends on the institution, but it doesn't even really necessarily matter towards tenure, depending on where you're at too. Okay. So um because a case book just isn't it's not a scholarly article. So right, right. um <clears throat> I could see at my current institution I think if the faculty are conscious of the student population attending their institution, like my, for example, at my institution, a lot of our students don't have access to a lot of resources, yeah. so they're coming into law school bare bones and hoping to make by make it by. So yeah. that the fact that they may not have to pay for textbooks is a pretty big sell for a lot of those students. So I could see that being the case. But as with every faculty complaint, you know, time. Who's going to do that? So that would be the other aspect. Yeah. Right, right. So, I mean, hopefully, there's. I get it. I, it's it's encouraging to me that someone uh, that a bigger name like like um, like Tim Wu has has used the uh, clone feature for making his own criminal criminal case. And I think he's he's um, changed it a decent amount from Jimmy Sook's casebook. But the fact that he he kind of used that as the base and built a, built his way out that um, another someone who's teaching at at the law school um, is also. I think he, he cloned um, the contracts book, and he's making his own version of the contracts course. But he took Charles Freed's uh, core money and built it off that. Um, I, think, I even feel like on the tenure side, yeah, it's almost, part of me feels like it's, it would be a bigger kind of feather in the cap of it, one who's on a tenure track, to be able to say, I took this time to make a case book that you know, was free to my students, it's custom to me, almost that being very good thing, I mean, like a publisher said, Stamp of approval. Like maybe that's sort of probably um, depends on the institution. Right, right. How they look right. at it. Mm -hmm. Whether they're okay spending them with them spending their time working on a textbook. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, the goal I mean, you know, I've heard it brought up, I've heard it brought up at the law school. Um, the idea that and, and we're kind of working our way there. The idea that wouldn't it be nice if Every 1L textbook was able to be purchased for the students. 
was able to be covered for the first year. Well, um, libraries are putting, I mean, you see now a lot of libraries are going back to purchasing the textbooks for reserves. We don't do it at our institution. We don't have money. Um, but I know there are places that are purchasing the textbooks. Really? So, uh, like, on that, so they buy like a dozen. They'll buy. Well, yeah, they'll buy a couple that the students can access. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know. Yeah, yeah there's some yeah. institutions that have the money to do. We don't have the money to do. It. Mm -hmm. but, um, mm -hmm. And yeah. right, and even that, then it's, it's still those just those students who can, or just the ones who get the ones that are in reserve. You know right. You have to get there early enough to have access to it. And there's a fight for it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I think that's, I think for anything like this, like show or, you know, anything like they'll sort of like just that, um, getting the ad costs, you not doing a hundred plus, you know, 15, 25 bucks. Yeah, I mean, with Cali. So you mentioned Elang Dell twice, so I'm going to love it. And then and we, have, we have Steve's book and his Wetlands course book on Elang Dell. But um, the Elang Dell books, we've got over 30 titles. And Hit most of the first year curriculum at this point, mm. um, so there uh, and then uh, even a lot of higher level stuff like wetlands, um, and uh, and we're we're averaging um, close to seventy five to eighty downloads a day. They're ninety percent PDF. Mm. That's what the students the are really interested. Hmm? The downloads are ninety yeah. PDF. Yeah, um, and then uh, faculty tend to download Word documents. As well as the PDF, um, and then some faculty then tinker with the Word documents and generate their own PDFs. We get actually very few hard copy uh, uh, requests. Um, we do generate our own, which we use at like ALS and here and, and other places. A couple of places have ordered a bunch, you know, sort of distribute to students and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, and the the, the uh, and then the other the uh, ebook formats, EPUB and, and Mobi, I mean, they're, they're really nobody really seems to download. I mean, law students hit those PDFs, and boom, they go. And and um, and the web ver. I mean, we offer web versions of some of the stuff um, using a system, uh, WordPress backed system called Pressbooks, um, which is uh, which doesn't get a lot of use mostly because we haven't really integrated into what we do. Um, but Pressbooks uh, probably is something that we're going to look at more in the future to allow faculty to actually be able to create um, as opposed to, because like right now, I mean, we tried, the Ealing Dell project in and of itself is like 12 years old at this point. It started with, it started with yeah, a keynote at this conference in 2006, right? So, so it's, uh, yeah, and H2O itself is actually really old. The, it, uh, yeah. I mean, it was originally written in Java a very long time ago. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, but when we, uh, uh, one of the things that we discovered quickly with Elang Dell was, was that um, for the most part, faculty weren't interested in creating their own materials. Like, they are, but they aren't. Like, they, it's, it's a thing that they do, right, because... Um, because it's easy enough to sort of pull a bunch of stuff together and hand to somebody to photocopy. I think is about about how it works. Yeah, and then um, and then beyond that, so so that's why we sort of. I mean, that's why Elang Dell almost looks like a traditional publisher now, right? We we you know pay faculty to write case books, but we don't do royalties. So so we their works for hire. So we own the copyright, which allows us to give them away and, and all that all that sort of stuff. And um, and so the the models sort of changed over time. But we've kept the platforms. I mean, there have been a couple of people who've written um, our Pressbooks installation is at lawbooks.cali.org. And there's a couple of people who've created stuff there, mm -hmm. created uh, uh, case books and, and teaching materials and stuff on that in that space. Um, but we've never been able to figure out sort of how to kind of get all that rolling. And in the broader... In the broader OER, open education resources space, where people, because Pressbooks is actually backed by dozens, like financially, by dozens of major universities and consortia um, who are putting a lot of money and developers, into it, which is actually kind of more important than the money. Um, they're finding that um, in order to get faculty 
do these things, even at, sort of at the undergrad level, um, they're at least having to give them some kind of enumeration, right? That that you know, and although at the undergrad level, writing a textbook actually carries so often carries more tenure weight than I know. I know case books often don't in, in law schools, but um, so it's, so it's interesting. Um, and and the other thing that um, and you may want to take a look at at, at press books primarily for its export stuff because they they provide two levels of PDF export. One is for uh, one is for web display and download, and then the second uh, uh, PDF format is is designed. Uh, specifically for uh, print on demand, mm. and they support a bunch of uh, they, they support the Amazon stuff, and they support Lulu and a couple of other operations. And there, um, and of course, what you end up with is, of course, all the books look the same except for the cover. But it, you know, it, it does do the um, it does you know do the, the the work pretty well. Right. Well, that's. I mean, you're so right about. I mean, it's <laughs> it is it's a long game. Like oh yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, that's. I mean, like I've been on HL since I started at the school, and it's, it feels just like a very, very slowly unfurling flower. Like kind of just, just a gradual and getting people on board, new platform rights. Um, and yeah, no, HL is. It's that was another challenge of. I mean, changing, you know, redesign, moving the platform is. It's from. It's kind of stuff from both, like, you know. Yeah, over it's like components of it, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, uh, the version before is from before that. So it's this, you know, uh, legacy, like legacy code that has to be sort of grappled with and you know purged ideally. Which helped to have someone in house and um, you know be, be able to do that work to kind of get up something, just make it, a, you know, yeah. But I'll definitely I'll definitely want to check out press books for the, for the export and if people are using it to build. I mean, that's all. That's all helpful information as for making something that, you know, when someone actually does say yes or for whatever reason, if it's admiration or just, you know, passion for the students, whatever drives it, um, they still have to do the play work, so to build it out. Um, yeah. Yeah, just following up on Gumbel's point, too, a lot of what we get on the team of reviews, the proposals for the ebooks, and a lot of what we get. The proposals are materials that faculty have been using in their classes and then just want to repackage as mm -hmm. an ebook. Again, we, on, on a team, we, and this makes it more difficult for Elmer and his crew, but on a team, we, we constantly are looking for something a little bit more expansive, using more interactive you know, interactivity and trying to take advantage of the fact that it is an e-book as opposed to you know, an e-version of a hard copy book. Mm -hmm. And so occasionally we'll get some books that have a little more interactivity involved and require them to do some exercises that take them out to the web, and, right. um, which again, you know, as you pointed out, I mean, there are other issues there with the you know, the copyright issues and things like that. Right, right. But again, in the book that I did, I, I tried to use a lot of you know, um, Creative Commons uh, material and linking to government websites mm -hmm. and all the resources and work they were doing was taking them to government websites. So, but again, it doesn't make it more difficult for the developer and his team to... Actually, it makes it more difficult for dead team. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, yeah. have, have you gotten that feedback from students as far as them like especially enjoying interactive stuff, like is that that, that being productive for useful for them? Is it more just for, sort of like you're trying to introduce it as an idea? Yeah, for the for the students that I've had, just using the book that I'm using, they do like that. Um, but again, um, it, it's a very limited number of students so far. We don't have a whole lot of books, and I think you're right that most students uh, are just happier just taking, you know, whatever's up there, downloading it in hard copy format. Because with other classes, you know, I've chosen uh, e -book, well, books that are available in e format because they're available in e format, mm -hmm. and then the students end up not getting the e-book, they just buy the hard copy book. And, uh, and uh, I thought I was saving them some money. Yeah, they, yeah. Got, you know, they, the hard they like yeah. them. They like the free copy. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what we can have. Yeah. I guess you're just going to slide like this so much reading anyway. Yeah. 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 yeah and, uh, another thing about, there's a um, there's an, uh, an annotation hypothesis, which is uh, an annotation system. Yeah. 
which is built into press books, which has always been the thing with um, with with law students. I mean, I remember having four color highlighters and going through those books. And 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 nowadays you can mark up, you know, uh, stuff online in that, uh, you know, in, in in much the same way with four colors and stuff. And even better, you can share those if you want to. And and hypothesis is um, uh, is they're they're doing a lot of really great work in that annotating, mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, space. Yeah. So it might be that might be a feature to look to add to this that, um, you know, that, that might, uh, you know, that might uh, drive students. Um, and they're uh, they're pretty easy to work with, and they have their own conference too. And it's sure. almost always the same week. It's happening right now. I don't know how they manage to always line it up with ours. Well, I did that. I went to that yeah, in twenty sixteen. Oh, you went? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. yeah. And um, and for sure, it's a, they got a, it's a nice um, annotator tool with yeah. you can overlay on the web, and then you can you know link other people's comments on it and stuff. Yeah, and you can do like private groups and stuff now, and, uh, and they've added they've added a bunch of stuff to it, and. It's all open source, so in theory you can run your own annotation server, so that you could run sort of your own annotations. Because I know there's, you know, law students always get a little well law faculty too about like, well, where is this stuff living? You know, and that's um, and uh, you know, and that's a uh, sort of a, of a concern on that too. But do, one more question, Elmer. Do you do you guys track? Uh, you said you track. Uh, purchases like the Lulu people who click through to do yeah kind of man purchases yeah okay and and there just aren't there just aren't many of those I mean we, we track we track downloads generally so now if you go everything's free to download but we do ask for a name and email address mm -hmm. um, and then we just sort of tuck that away um, and then we have our analytics tracks that so that we can we can see what's going on cool. yeah but we run our own analytics we don't use Google. It's been, I mean, definitely for torts and for contracts, which are the two we have on Amazon now. Students, I mean, that is, like, that was the, they did use that book. I mean, that was the way. So basically they, um, they just, yeah, the, the, those instructors were able to get away from doing the uh, print packets, course packs, um, and sort of that, that spending, and they stuck with the print on ramp. Yeah, and, and I think that, I think that what happens with, um, with faculty that adopt e Langdell books, they just tell the students to go and download them. They don't really mention the. Because I suspect that more students would buy the print copies because they, they do if they were explicitly offered those. Right. Um, but to the best of our knowledge, anybody who's adopting e Langdell books pretty much is just linking them to, uh, you know, linking them back to the website, and then the students just download the PDF yeah. as, the, as the easiest way to go. Sure. That's what I, I did that in my legal research class. Right. That's what I. Did. I did have, I think I saw a few of them floating around that okay. had the actual. Yeah, we get, we get some, and it's actually but, a legal research book is actually our best seller. Yeah, so that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Just out of curiosity, yeah. so I have one course that I manage that uh, uses the business review course packs, Harvard Business Review course packs. Okay. How would this cross with that? Does that seem to be kind of a conflict? Uh, so those, um, I mean, those are purchased, right? Yes, but yeah. there's just the cases that they're pulling. Okay. Uh, just, so just, I, I don't know what's in the, what's the content. I mean, there, there's commentary in the case, right? I thought that there were more like articles. Sometimes, sometimes there are articles. I mean, he's not using it for that, studies? though. I'm, yeah. Are these case studies? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I think those are, those, those do have some... A little extra commentary yeah, in yeah. them. Yes, okay. yes. I, I apologize, I'm not a lawyer, so yeah. I don't know the difference between all these yeah. things. Okay. Um, that's the kind of thing. So, like, if you were, if that was on the web, I don't know if they were, if they buy them or if they, or if they sent, they case studies bought. And they they get we a build link. it every semester, and then we put okay. a link in our course, and they go and they grab it. Okay, yeah. So that's the kind of thing. Like, you would you would throw that link into the uh, like into the casebook. Like in this case, the digital casebook. You do an add link, and then it would be the link to the case study, and the student would click that and go there. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So wait, but if she's doing that and she's paying copyright permission to use that specific case study. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't other people have access to that? Well, if, if the link, I mean, unless the link, I assume the link, the student would have to log in if they click the link, or they put in some sort of code or something like that. It's not just yeah. an open link. It's kind of open once they send you the link. No, we put the link in, they have to go and complete the purchase. Oh, so, so then your students are paying for yeah, it? Yeah, they're paying oh, for it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we, we just go and we build this course pack, and we put all the materials together, and then they go and register with Harvard, Harvard oh, Business okay. Review. 
and they, they pull the content from there. Yeah, what we do for copyrighted content that is put on like a public facing casebook mm -hmm. is um, if it's like a PDF or something like that, um, basically we just put it in a location that's behind a pinwall. So there's sort of, there's like a file list, file location um, that Harvard has and you can just set it so you have to have a Harvard pen to access it or like a, like a law school specific pen. And then, like and, then, and then lots of uh, databases like Hein Online and things like that, um, if you use their content, they actually require you to link directly to their content rather than downloading it and putting it uh, behind your own password. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that would be, then, yeah, in that case, then we put the Hein Online link. Right. Um, but that's another thing with sort of like, we have that question from instructors of, and so it's a difficult thing to get is so like I have uh, you know this content on the web that I want to include in my export. Uh, will it just pull it in from the web? It's like it's not, it's not that it's not that simple. Um, so that I mean that might be something we look at as far as see it gets complicated when it comes to actually a book you're putting out there. But if they're just sort of making a course back, maybe there's a course back that maybe we can toggle on, and then it does its best to scrape the content from the site. But then you're getting you keep getting into muddy water with all the different sites and how they have the content hosted. Um, cool. Uh, hypothesis. Um, I, just, uh, I thought about this, and I, I apologize if you mentioned that earlier, but um, so can a student, when they're accessing the casebook, do they have an individualized login to access the casebook itself, or is it just a link to access the casebook? Just a link. Yeah, a student okay. doesn't have to log in to access, okay. yeah. Okay, so if is they that log something, it, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I just was wondering if that's something you were looking at because when we talk about this kind of editor, the ability to edit a casebook for an individual student being a big part of their ability oh, to yeah, take so, yeah. notes, that sort of stuff. Right, so as it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so if a student yeah. creates an account, that student can close can it. Can do that and go in and, <laughs> and, yes. and then kind of highlight. Yeah, start adding really all their highlights, their annotations. Yeah, because that would be the best And uh, to the point where they can actually even kind of outline the class um, directly in H2O as opposed to having to create their own separate outline. Well, that's, uh, that's a good topic. What's that? It's a topic about the project as well. You know, thank uh, but yeah, so that's so we definitely have some students who will do that. They'll yeah. be taking the course and be like, I just want I'll, I'll have my own copy of it. So look on it and then I'll use add annotations and that kind of work. Good point. What kind of feedback have you got from students? Um, so yeah, again, most um, most of the feedback has been uh, they they just like that it is well I guess I guess say the um, the ones who started to make the print on demand books very, very, they're big fans of that. They really like it. And if they're being custom to the course, it being specific to the instructor, um, you know, got like, it's a goofy cover for the contracts one, kind of, they like that. Um, so, so they, so they really like it. They like that they have a hard copy. Um, the so pricing. How many copies did you sell of this? So now we, we've got, we've had a few hundred sell, because he sold it for one, well, corporations, yeah. So, so both books we've had, they, most of the students in the class purchase it. Um, and it's, we basically round up to an even, um, and sort of like <coughs> 22 or something like that, and then it's, we sell it at 25, and then the, the, the couple extra bucks just go to the library for the work put in to make the book. No, no, that's fine. I mean, I'm just curious. I mean, I'm still, I can see faculty wanting to have books, just not the students, but I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, again, like, like, I think it's one, just because it's, Maybe because it's that case book too, and not just like a supplementary set of readings. Mm -hmm. They would they like to just have the book instead of um, potentially having to print out eight hundred pages themselves. Um, yeah, um, but uh, but yeah. So it's been um, it's been it's been very positive, especially with the move to the print on demand stuff. Um, they like to, some some of them would use the platform again. Most would they try they would try to get a print out some kind of for doing the actual reading. But we've also gotten the kind of feedback of like it's helpful, it's convenient if they're if they're going somewhere if they're on the bus or something they want to pull up a reading to have it on the web they can access it that way um, you know so it's almost to have the option to have the web option uh, is they like to have that as a fallback preferred uh, to have it in a book format. My favorite example of a professor using it is the one who this is before print on demand and the professor had a laptop ban. 
uh, in class, so they couldn't even bring the casebook in via their laptop. They had to print it out themselves and bring it in. I, 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 and, and, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to shame the professor because I can't remember who it was. But. <laughs> Would, okay. <laughs> I might still be nice and not name them, but I, I don't actually remember who it was. <laughs> well, they, 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 they still get a print allotment? They do, yeah. The students will get a certain, like, you know, 20 bucks a semester or whatever to print out, print out of. Um, but even that, I think, but I think a case book would exceed the allotment. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, yeah. sort of, like, including print allotments slash uh, copy center printouts, it's like, there's, you're spending more per student than it would be for them to buy the just buy the print on demand book, which is all one you know, packed together um, as well. Um, okay, we've reached the slide zero. Um, this is my email, B Johnson at Law at Harvard.edu. Um, definitely reach out to me. Thoughts, feedback. Um, if you want to take a look at the platform, I didn't put the link up here because we're official launches this summer, but it's at um, uh, opencasebook.org, or the alpha.opencasebook.org. Um, uh, yeah. We're on GitHub. It's open source. Um, this is the Library Innovation Lab website, lil.lava.harbor.edu. Um, but if you're also in Boston or Cambridge, come and around like on a Friday, we have sort of this open space hangout time on Fridays where people are just kind of working on projects and sometimes people are working on fun stuff. Um, so come to the library, come to Langdell and come say hi and hang out if you're in the area too. Um, I brought some of these printouts which are sort of like a blurby, I'll just do this. But just sort of a little little pitchy, what's the deal? <laughs> what's the deal with airplane food sort of uh, things? Um, Cards here, let's see, little lab name, and also uh, extra stickers from the PERMA presentation. Tom? Uh, so I guess with, uh, but you, you, with my, after switching to CAP for your um, case ingestion, new cases would still have to be, new cases that they come out and are asked to be in, would still have to be manually ingested? Uh, so As I understand, they, they don't, there aren't immediate plans to add new cases to CAP, right? Yeah, it's, that's a, um, um, they would call it CAP now is sort of them, their, their way of trying to answer that question. How do we, new cases, new opinions, how do we get those in the database, in the CAP database? Um, so it's something that there, that definitely is, is in mind. I mean, obviously like the full, full out digitization Thrust is done, right? But um, the intent uh, is that ideally the states and the courts would be would be publishing them in a citable format online themselves, right? So that CAP wouldn't need to go any farther forward. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That'd be nice. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think there's. Um, I think the plan is for new ones. I don't know. They're, 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 I don't have a, have a great answer for you, but I okay. know that that's something they're talking about. How do we, uh, how do we, uh, how do we, how do we handle new cases that come in? For the time being, it might just be, uh, it might just be uh, manual. I might have to go back to ingesting a manual. And the really important question: Who inherited the task of manually ingesting? You did. <laughs> yes, sir. Isn't it fun? It's so fun. Uh, yeah. Well, it's also fun to find the, okay, so here's, here's those things. So, if you were curious, I know, it's brutal. Um, <laughs> here's, that, that's an example of, there's a reporter, so that's them taking the binding off. This is the uh, guillotine, so it chops the, chops the binding off. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> uh, Do you have pictures of the scanner running? <laughs> yes, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, Scanner's cool. Yeah, scanner. so then, so here's, here's that scanner. So this is. I think at their fastest they were doing 10,000 pages a day in the scanner. So it's high speed, it, it takes, it photographs both sides uh, as it goes through and uh, <laughs> flops down. Uh, so the books are, they don't rebind them, but they put them, they put them together with the binding, the cover, vacuum seal them uh, into, into an item and then there is a uh, 
there is a limestone mine in Louisville, Kentucky, that now houses at least 22,000 volumes. So when uh, nuclear apocalypse comes, we will have a way, a place to restart the law. Um, These are our scrolls, Alexander. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> well, I had an opportunity to, to see all this in action a couple of years ago, and it was it was it, like watching that guillotine work was loud and scary. Yes. And the scanner was interesting because it was really fast. That's typically a scanner that's used in the financial industry for high speed like scanning checks and financial documents and stuff. And like having all these like, you know, just shelf after shelf of vacuum packed books was really weird. <laughs> it yeah. was a strange, strange thing to see. Um, what was weird was like how much, how little, like we, we knew that, because they have like Harvard Depository, which is like in Central Mass, and like all the books at the libraries at the university, but then all the books are at the repository. And uh, before this project started, there were questions of, like, we know we have the volumes, but we didn't know how, we didn't actually know how many exactly. We didn't know, like, like there were numbers that we were just sort of like, they're there, but we'll see how they are. And then there were things with how they were packed, with they were, like, how they did, again, I don't know too many specifics, but sort of how they did the pick and pack, they got mixed in with other, other items. So they weren't, recorders weren't separate, so there was a whole, Another branch of it, which is like hunt, you know, hunt for, you know, Illinois 1924, you know, through 28, because we can't find those, those and um, filling those gaps was Herculean and heroic and not something that I would have been any help with, because that is, but we had, they're very detail oriented, hardworking, good, you know, that team. The biggest digitization project they'd done before this was, you know, um, Few, a couple thousand pages, a few thousand pages, and that took them a few months. And for them to kind of buckle down and, and have get the get their get their process, and because um, everything was digitized, it got sent out to um, a group to um, almost like Mechanical Turks. We had I think it was a group in Indonesia or something, but they were the ones who did all the redaction. So they had to redact all the you know all the reporters, the, the page numbers. All those little things that they got, all those special copyright applied to, you know. Um, so there was the digitization, the redaction, and then the metadata, building the API, um, the schema. I think there's a yeah. So uh, yeah, this is the guillotine. This is dramatic, <laughs> the chop. Um, let's go back. Cool. So yeah, I would love to talk more if you have an instructor who might be interested. Or if you want to be linked, or if you think they need a little more of a something to get them intrigued, maybe a link to a course book that would be similar to theirs, or something like that, um, just please uh, send me an email, or email the Lilla Law address, it's on that little flyer there, and um, we can go from there. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.